Thank you, Professor Amorti, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee and the students from Seoul National University and my colleagues from Kyodai. Uh, thank you for listening to my, pre listening to my presentation. Uh, as the title says, I'm going to talk about the concept of spatiality between two theorists, Carl Schmitt and Niklas Luhmann. Carl Schmitt is perhaps more traditionally associated in international law theory. Uh, Niklas Luhmann, not so much, but hopefully this afternoon I can make a case for why Niklas Luhmann should enjoy a higher place in international legal theory. Uh, and the focus around the comparison, as my title says, will be around the concept of spatiality. If we think about international law, I think spatiality becomes an obvious point, or, although perhaps as my presentation progresses, we'll see that spatiality is perhaps maybe not less important, but maybe we can have a more sophisticated understanding of it. So, the problem statement that we deal with. So, I say that one common element between Schmidt and Luhmann, both, like I said, serve a traditional German dish called grand theory, meaning they're not focusing on small, specific little technicalities or legal points, but both of them, in different ways, try to create a theory that could describe society globally. So it's grand theory in this sense. Um, Schmidt, for a long time, for reasons that we'll see, has been kind of a persona non grata in legal scholarship for many, many decades. Although recently, especially since 9-11, he has kind of re-entered into the discourse, academic discourse, um, one article I read, just as a side note, said they just tracked the citations of Schmidt's work in 70s, 80s, 90s, and major international law journals. It was like between five and ten citations in it in, in a decade, where now it's uh, many, many, many per year since since the 2000s. So engagement with Schmidt has increased a lot. But I think, and he's been trying, people are trying to reinvent him in a more modern context. But I think there are some problems with this theory, some fundamental flaws. And a scholar that in international law is much more neglected, Niklas Luhmann, perhaps can shed some light, shed some insight uh, that I think is lacking in Schmidt. And I will explain these during the course of my presentation. Finally, to make this not a strictly theoretical presentation, I will end by speaking about the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and showing how perhaps a recent agreement like this reflects the theory of Luhmann more than it does reflect the theory of Schmidt, which I thus hold up as a case to substantiate my argument for Luhmann. So, what is the commonality that, in my opinion, between Schmidt and Luhmann? Although, like I said, they have grand theories, I think one place where they resemble one another is that both offer theories, what I call the, theory, the theories of the line. They are opposite in how they view space. But one thing that they have in common is the border or the line. And they both, in their theories, draw borders or lines, whether they do it knowingly or unknowingly, but they do this in very different ways. And I think this is where a key difference lies between them. So if both have, are proposing theories of lines or theories of borders or theories of boundaries, my question is, who's better at drawing these lines? Uh, 
like I said, who is the better draftsman? So first, just some biographical background on Carl Schmidt. As you can see, he was born in the 1800s in Germany to a very Catholic family. And although he had later in his life moved away from the formal Catholic church, it, throughout his life, he was a devout uh, Christian and followed a kind of Catholic ethos, which is clearly reflected in his theory. This is not a benign point. He graduated law from the University of Strasbourg and then became, uh, in the late 1920s, he became a professor of law. In 1933, with the rise of Hitler, he became a member of the Nazi party as a young professor and soon became a president of the Union of National Socialist Jurists. This is very significant because uh, I claim that we cannot separate these two men's theories without uh, considering their, since it's a theory of space, space, they are situated in a time and a space and this has influenced their theories and Carl Schmitt living in Third Reich, Germany, being a Nazi, is, it's very instructive to his eventual legal theory. He also, just as a point of interest, wrote uh, articles, uh, many articles supporting Hitler and the Third Reich regime, the Nazi party also denouncing Jews. He even had the suggestion that in legal journals, uh, Jewish scholars should have a little footnote to their name, signifying that they're Jewish because in his, arg his argument was that Jewish scholars fundamentally couldn't reason in the same logic that German jurists did. Uh, after Germany lost the war, he refused to go through denazification uh, processes and basically for the rest, as you can see, he lived a long time after the Second World War, but basically he couldn't find good academic positions after that because he never truly renounced his, uh, his, his past with the Nazi regime. So more on his theory, or as I said, the lines that Schmidt draws. In his theory, space, land specifically, plays a very big role. Human beings are situated on earth, on land, and it, land becomes a precondition for all political and legal order. You have to have land in order to have politics and law. Man conquers land, he demarcates it, he starts exploiting it, farming it, and drawing borders around it. And within these borders, politics start happening and the state arises. So once you have a state, there's always you have a border, as I said, you have a line. Always outside the line, there's the foreign territory, the, in German, the Ausland, which just means outside land, outside area. Uh, for Schmidt, this is important. You have the inside of the border and you have the outside. Inside, you have order. Outside, it's chaotic, it's unruly, and a state always has to conquer this land in order to demarcate it, bring it in, into, from the outside into the inside and establish order once again. Uh, this is how international law comes to being for Carl Schmitt. In Europe, after the Peace of Westphalia, uh, you had the European nation states and Europe was cut up and divided to its maximum. And therefore, the new, after the new world was discovered, then European states suddenly had something outside again, outside the border, that could be, and it shifted conflict from the European continent to, to the new world, where the new world was this wild, untamed, chaotic realm that could be conquered and ordered by European nation states once again. So there's, there's this 
interplay between the inside and the outside, internal, external of the border. Uh, inside is order, inside Europe is order, outside the border is bar bar barbarity. Uh, this is the origins of international law for Schmidt, but then what happens is with the voyages of discovery, eventually the whole planet got discovered, all land got put down on maps, and suddenly, as you can see, the border reaches a kind of a limit. It cannot expand anymore. The whole world has been discovered. So now the inside is suddenly without its outside. Suddenly we have a kind of universalism. Uh, for Schmidt, he recognizes especially America as the strongest actor on the, glo on the global inside. Uh, and without this outside to be conquered, America has a kind of a uh, monopolistic power and it can enforce a universalism on the rest of the world. This, for Schmidt, as a German, and you could say as a Nazi, this is problematic because universalism doesn't mean universe of all people, but a kind of an American or Anglo-American universalism. Um, his solution that he suggests to this is basically, instead of a unipolar American world order, is to have a multipolar order with different powers. Of course, one of which would be Germany. And these multiple poles, he calls Großraume, which just means great, great or big spaces. And it's a more or less multipolar theory where you have strong states surrounded by satellites that, he, that the strong states can influence. So he thought maybe America could be one on the North American continent and Germany could be one on the European continent, etc. Um, so this is how you see the development from his inside and outside and eventually when the outside disappears it becomes a crisis for Carl Schmitt. A few decades later we have Niklas Luhmann, also German, although he was born in a family that was critical to the Nazi, Nazi regime. But towards the end of the war, he was young, but towards the end, he, as a teenager, he got conscripted during the last phases of the war into the Luftwaffe and was consequently captured by the Americans and spent something like a year in a prisoner of war camp where he was abused and bullied by American soldiers. Uh, but after the war, he uh, went to study law, got his degree, then studied at Harvard, and uh, soon became a law professor, not a law professor, he became a professor of sociology at the University of Bielefeld, where he stayed for the rest of his life. And uh, one year before his death, he uh, published his greatest work, The Theory of Society. As you can hear, it's just in the name, it's a theory of society. How ambitious does that sound? Anyway, so what is Luhmann's theory? Where does Niklas Luhmann draw the lines? The first important difference between Luhmann and Schmidt, and what makes this comparison at first perhaps surprising, is that in the theory of Luhmann, he almost never talks about space. So why are we uh, comparing Schmidt and Luhmann on space? For Luhmann, the object of analysis is not space, but communication, social communication. As you can think, post-World War II, well, even before World War II, but especially since then, society has become global. Communication passes around the world instantly across borders. Borders have basically become incidental. So Schmidt's lines on the ground become irrelevant to Luhmann. But, however, he does draw lines. Where does he draw the line? For Luhmann, and sorry, this is very complex theory, and I'll try to get the essence of it quickly. 
But for Luman, communication around the world become, has become so complex since the Middle Ages, since the Renaissance. He also starts his theory from Europe, like Schmidt. Um, but social communications have become so complex that kind of communications of a certain kind that serve a certain function start collecting around each other and they start communicating within themselves and it becomes more and more and more and more complex and eventually it creates a system of communication by itself and this system of communication serves a specific function so we have kinds of communication that serve the function of of law we have a system that serves the function of politics, economics, media, religion, and a few others, science. So, these systems draw a boundary between themselves and all other communication. So again, we have a line. So we have the legal system and everything that's outside of the legal system. So this is where Luhmann draws his lines. Um, What's also an, an important difference between him and Schmidt, Schmidt saw countries as hierarchically uh, arranged, like America being universal, or Germany being the chief of a Großraum. For Luhmann, these, you cannot speak of hierarchy between these systems. Uh, the inside and the outside of the system you cannot say law is more important than politics or politics is more important than economics. Uh, these systems are all equal because they all serve different functions. You cannot say one is more important than the other one because they're essentially completely different in character. Um, this relationship between inside and outside being non-hierarchical, Luhmann calls, he talks about asymmetric antonyms. The example he uses is that of Greek and barbarian that comes from ancient Greek times. He says before, up until the modern age, he, which he put somewhere in the 1800s, uh, you had asymmetric antonyms, the Greeks and the barbarians. As you can see, this is very similar to, to Schmidt's idea of the inside and the outside. Inside being ordered, being Greek, and the outside being chaotic and to be conquered and to be ordered, to be done anything with. This is barbaric. For Luhmann, this distinction of inside and outside disappears. The, the, not, not, not the distinction between inside and outside. The hierarchical nature of the distinction disappears in Luhmann. So, in international law, how can we see this? In the Paris Agreement, some background that I think is relevant. So in 1997 with the Kyoto Protocol, that separated countries into developed countries and developing countries. And most of the responsibility was placed on developed countries as they were seen as being responsible for creating climate change and that's the ones that need to solve it and the ones that have the power to solve it. Uh, the developed countries with time as previously classified undeveloped countries gained in power, specifically China or India. Developed countries became unsatisfied with this distinction, uh, this hierarchical distinction of inside and outside. And in Copenhagen, a new agreement was attempted, but eventually was unsuccessful up until two years ago when we have the Paris Agreement, which was signed almost universally and was applicable to all parties and the distinction of developing and developed was done away with. Uh, this comes back to, for me, the idea of the whole world being cartographated being mapped, uh, we as a society now understand that a problem like global warming, many other problems, but in this case global warming, we cannot 
base this on Schmidt's lines anymore. It, it affects all of us and it affects us in different ways uh, and a much more sensible way to draw these lines is on social distinctions and not on territorial distinctions. Uh, so therefore, yes, the Paris Agreement, I argue, represents a redrawing of the line. As I said, climate change is a global problem with differentiated local impacts. Countries like China and India were invited from the outside to step into the legal defining line. And uh, yes, now I'm repeating myself. Well, one of the differences was that one big change with time was that now it's clear that developing countries have even surpassed developed countries in financial investment into uh, renewable energy. And another sign that Schmidt's lines in the sand are making less and less sense is that non-state actors have contributed a lot to the Paris Agreement and as we all know in international law in general non-state actors are becoming more and more important. The Paris Agreement has been hailed as an achievement for multilateralism and at least one scholar has mentioned that as an instrument of international law it has been good at reconciling sovereignty with collective goals. Uh, as with Luhmann's theory, the agreement is based on functional differ dif differentiation rather than developed versus non-developed, since that, and I quote, no longer reflects global realities. Uh, some conflicts with possible legal conflicts in international law with the Paris Agreement. Uh, Carozo and Klein have uh, identified at least two general types of conflicts. One is systemic conflict. And again, I argue that Luhmann's distinction can uh, describe this much better than Schmidt. We have the problem of climate change, the ecological system versus the economic system. Uh, many companies are opposed to, I, I mean this conflict is obvious, big companies want to keep producing and keep, are very dependent on fossil fuels and uh, consumerist culture. This is in direct conflict with, the, with our uh, climate system. Um, one solution that's been proposed is that low carbon goods should be economically liberalized and thus legal regimes such as the climate change uh, environmental law regime and world trade uh, law regime uh, this conflict can be solved not through states as i said but through intersystemic solutions you can use the economic system to solve legal disputes or legal con not disputes legal co legal conflicts secondly the uh, the second type of conflicts that the paris agreement can bring in with existing international law is a normative conflict uh, some scholars say that this should not be a massive problem because the paris agreement is a very flexible one and it's not based on like previous instruments on duties between states, but has been hailed as a network of bilateral relation, relations and objective obligations that states have to fulfill. So what I'm trying to practically show is that the Paris Agreement, it suits Luhmann's theory more because it addresses global trans-border problems. The state-territorial border becomes irrelevant. The instrument asks of states, or it, it differentiates between states, not hierarchically, as in developed and non-developed, but differentiates on them functionally. And finally, as I've said, the legal systems, uh, the, the 
problems that this instrument can cause can be solved through cooperation between systems, not strictly between countries. So, in conclusion, what I'm saying is that Schmidt's theory, a lot of it might be useful for international law in today's uh, climate, but his view on spatiality is outdated. Some say it was even outdated during his time of writing. Uh, it's also very much arguable that he was uh, writing as a proponent of the Nazi regime, which colored his theory undoubtedly. And yes, it doesn't con uh, reflect our society today. I do, however, argue that Luhmann's lines of so drawing the line on social communication provides a much more useful framework. And it's not some abstract idea, but something like the Paris Agreement can show us that even this very abstract theory can have practical implications for international law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the brilliant and very compact uh, presentation, Mr. Nico. And then now uh, I want to ask some comments and questions to um, yeah, the presenter's uh, presentation. Yeah, I will begin now. The encouragement has been criticized and even stigmatized for his political stance towards the Nazism and his judicial allegiance with the Third Reich. Uh, his works and thoughts have been still influential even in this century. Inter alia, uh, his continuous work on international law originated from the context of the post-war analysis towards uh, some traditional legal concepts. Uh, in his international legal works, uh, Shumi tried to analyze, analyze uh, the modern initiative of post-war initial and international norms on humanitarian implication, including peace, order, and security by the Allied. Uh, apart from the international legal laws, his concern was the prevalence of foreign legal concepts. Understanding concept understanding has continued since the 1930s. Therefore, his notion of speciality progressed consequently into a defen uh, defensive direction characterizing the core of the Schmidt's theory of international law. Yeah. So the speciality became connected to the possibility of control, control the law. Schmidt saw the only way to oppose the Western allies and their notion by suggesting the partition of the whole world into some large spaces through his analogy of mono, mono doctrine. Uh, these would, uh, these would consist of groups of several states um, united by their affiliation within, within the same orbit of an empire. Such an order could be defined as a function within a singular block, speciality. As a result, his legal speciality underpinned diplomacy of hierarchy within a block, uh, with diplomacy of a formal equality presumed between different blocks. Yeah. However, the view of Schmidt cannot overcome the traditional frame of nation state, for his focus on st space necessarily leads to his expansion. Its expansion uh, on an untamed land before now uh, became the target of a subjugation where the new legal order of a block needs to be established often in the name of the ruler's sovereignty. Such an approach is combined with his adherence to the sovereignty in a state of exception. Domestically, the speciality of state could turn into the nationalistic mechanism of uh, overlooking various actors within the territory. Anyhow, the traditional system of law of nations could not confront spatial, a spatial conflict of each legal order. Therefore, therefore, the need for the alternative perspective towards the spatiality, spatiality other than nationalism became magnified. Uh, for Nicholas Luhmann, the speciality of systems like law and politics expands itself beyond the national borders and blocks. His understanding of the spatial range reaches the global dimension with a broader uh, legal perspective, 
he develops his grand theory on the social existence uh, with the premise that uh, the world society is unified according to the principle of a functional differentiation, uh, then marginalizing the notion of national or the traditional border. Uh, since the contemporary space of international law is too vast to confront with the porous to of dichotomy by Carl Schmitt, uh, Luhmann's functional approach is expected to offer the more flexible means for relevant analysis. Uh, but his, uh, at the same time, Luhmann's theory has tendency to place the human being basically outside the system. Yeah, the, the status of hum each human being is very ambiguous. And that unless his or her communicative action is constituted within the social context, uh, it's very ambiguous for uh, each human being where to be placed. So now I want to ask you two questions. Uh, first, uh, were there any alternative way in the functional understanding of the of Nicholas Luhmann to confront the theoretical ambiguity of the status of human being? The access to justice or institution for human being needs to be guaranteed even outside the functional context, context especially in the position of homo sapiens, literally, or for the subaltern people. And then secondly, is Carl Schmitt's applied usage of catechon, yeah, catechon, as the last secular restrainer against the destructive legal order still buried even in the grand theory of the social system? For example, catechon versus antichrist. According to some Paolo Vilnos comment, the catechon may impede both the world of all against all and against, against all and against totalitarianism but how to eliminate them all. Though the concept may be of some dichotomy, it contains some possibility to confront some crew, to confront the potential contingency of social system. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wang, uh, for your comments and your very interesting questions. I think both your questions could probably serve to be an article each by themselves. To, to answer. Uh, as for your first question about the role of the human being in Luhmann systems theory and what this means for the homo sake or the subaltern, uh, this is a good question and a controversial aspect of, for many of Luhmann's theory where he puts the individual human being outside of his analysis of society. As I've said in my presentation, for Luhmann, society consists of communications and communication only. He goes so far as to say, human beings cannot communicate, only communications can communicate. And this is a cause of great controversy, um, especially in law if we're talking about the legal subject being a central, <laughs> inescapable fact. Uh, but I think this point is not as controversial upon a second reading or a finer reading. So the point is that Luhmann distinguishes between three levels of systems. Biological systems, which are our bodies and plants and animals out there. Uh, secondly, there's psychic systems, which, is, which are our thoughts and our psychologies. And then thirdly, social systems. Um, and he says, just as biological systems Biologists study the interaction between cells. Uh, psych psychic system psychologists study your thoughts and your brain patterns and brain waves. Uh, if we want to analyze society, the object of analysis becomes communication, not human beings. Um, we need human beings to communicate, but that's not the point that's not the level that we're investigating. Uh, the point is also that human beings communicate in different systems. We all communicate within the legal system, we all communicate within the economic system. When we buy something, we all go vote in the political system, we all watch and read the newspaper uh, in the media system. But each time we make one of these communications to for the level of analysis of Luhmann to say that it's the same person doing these separate things is not important. It's 
each is looked at within each system. That's why the human being becomes decentralized. Um, this is important because these systems only function within themselves and communicate within themselves. That means that it, it's important for any individual human to steer these systems. They're much too vast anyway for one individual or a group of individuals to steer these systems. The legal system, the p political system, the economic system, it, if we think about it, it should be clear to us that we cannot really steer these systems that much. They become global, they become much too big, we cannot control them anymore. They evolve by their own internal logic. Um, so, human being is put outside of society. And then, this is really interesting when we talk about the Homo Saka, which is Agamben, of course, is famous for, and he leans a lot on Carl Schmidt. Uh, what's interesting, even etymologically, about Homo Saka, Homo, and then Saka is not, it's the root of the English sacred, but the original meaning is not sacred, it means outside. So it's literally the human outside. So what Luhmann talks about, without ever saying this word, he also talks about the human outside of society. Um, so, the homo saka is included in the law by being excluded, much like the human subject in syst Luhmann's systems theory. And this is interesting because, as I said, Luhmann talks about the distinction between the Greek, the uh, asymmetric antonyms of the Greeks and the barbarians. He says in our modern society, society doesn't make this distinction anymore between who's included and who's excluded. There's no, in previous society there were caste systems or class systems. In modern society, we do not exclude certain people from certain things. Everyone in theory is a equal legal subject is a political subject, is a economic subject. Uh, so Luhmann says we've done away with this distinction between Greeks and barbarians, inclusion and exclusion. But he turns back on himself and he says if you go to South America to the favelas or in my country we have townships or ghettos and other places, you see people who are who are de facto excluded from society. And Luhmann says this can be a... Even though we have no formal criteria for inclusion or exclusion, only each system has its own inclusion and exclusion. For example, if you get excluded by the legal system, getting, being found guilty of a crime and being put in prison, suddenly you can find yourself being excluded by the economic system, you find yourself excluded by the political system, you might not be able to vote anymore, or if you're a person without a passport, you even lose legal subjectivity. So Luhmann admits that there are people outside of the social system being excluded, even though there's no formal criteria for this anymore. Um, he also, just as a footnote, this is where he criticizes a lot of critical theory and Marxist theory. He says, oh, the, the idea of a hierarchical society where people are being exploited by a ruling class. He says that semantic doesn't work anymore because if you look at, he says these people are not being exploited. If you go to these areas, I mean, exploited for what? Not even for labor, they're unemployed. Uh, they're literally just on the periphery of society, not included into the, the system. So, Luan says society doesn't have a de facto basis for inclusion and exclusion, but people are being excluded. And the problem he identifies then is in society's self-description of itself. The theories we have of society, saying that oh, formally everyone is included, we all have human rights, we all have the same, we're all equal in front of the law, when in fact that's not true. And this he poses as, writing in the 90s, he said the big challenge of this century will be to able to account for this de facto exclusion of people from society. And I think that this is then where Homo Sake... So I don't have a solution to your problem, I'm just saying, or your question, I'm just saying Luhmann also identified this problem, and, but didn't have an answer. But this is, anyway, theoretically where you would 
place this question within his writings. Then, on your second question, on Schmidt and the Katakon, oh, I'm also not sure on the pronunciation of that. Um, <laughs> Katakon. Um, so, for those who don't know, this is an idea coming sp from Christianity, but specifically uh, Catholicism, um, where it's an idea that there's some kind of force in the world that's keeping the Antichrist at bay. So it's a force of good and stopping the end of the world from coming, the coming of the Antichrist. But then this creates a dichotomy or a paradox in itself in that according to the Bible, the Antichrist has to come in order for the world to end and the kingdom of heaven to come. So if you have something good keeping the Antichrist at bay, time is kind of suspended and history cannot finish. So you have this, uh, th this is what the catacomb is. Uh, so how, how do we fit into this into systems theory, right? Uh, okay, my first point on the catacomb for Schmidt, this is, well, not just for Schmidt, but the point is this is a highly theological concept. And, uh, I don't even think, well, generally Christian, but I think specifically c Catholic. Uh, for legal scholarship, uh, we can question how useful the, the point of the catacon is for us. But anyway, so I thought about this, and I thought maybe there is something of the catacon in systems theory that I can propose. Uh, so I said the, the catacon, again, it's making a distinction between good and evil and order and uh, the Antichrist, right? Or, or justice and injustice. Uh, so I would say for Luhmann, the outside is not uh, marked by chaos or evil. It's just complexity. He just describes it as infinite complexity that no human or system can completely understand. And we have, in his theory, there are different ways of dealing with complexity. And two are important. One is systems themselves. So a system is always there to reduce the complexity of its environment. Secondly, and importantly for the Katakon, is time itself. So if the future is infinitely complex with infinite possibilities, Luhmann says the role of the present is to reduce the complexity of the future. Once the present arrives, all these other avenues disappear and only one is chosen, right? So, yeah, he says the future contains a surplus of possibilities and the present serves to reduce that complexity to one possibility. Uh, and as I said in my presentation, systems are functional. Each system has a different function. Luhmann identifies the function of the legal system as the, the function of the legal system is to stabilize future expectations. Because of the legal system, I can walk to my house tonight and reasonably not expect to be murdered. Or if I lend someone money, I can, the law tells me tomorrow he'll pay me back. And if he doesn't, I can resort to some remedy. Uh, so, in that sense, the legal system serves what Luan calls as a kind of an immune system for society. It postpones decisions and it stabilizes our expectations and it, it prevents changes from being too dramatic and from the future from being too unpredictable. So what I'm saying is that perhaps the law itself can serve as a kind of catacomb uh, because it has this kind of continuous postponement of decisions being made. What Luhmann says, the future can never begin because it's always being postponed. But then, so perhaps the legal system itself is a kind of catacomb. But finally, I would like to say that Luhmann does not ascribe any kind of moral value to, this fun to the legal system. And it's also devoid of any theological significance. It's 
for him, just the social fact. It's not good or bad. It's just the way things are. So I hope that answers your questions sufficiently. Thank you.